All right, we're recording. Okay, sounds good. So I'll call to order at 12.02 p.m. Eastern Time, the Cannabis Control Board Sustainability Subcommittee. Uh, president from the CCB, we have Nelly and Kyle. Um, Kyle, who else do we have in the room? We've got three members of the public. All right, sounds good. Um, from NACB, we have myself, Jacob, um, and we also have uh, two of the other subcommittee members, uh, Billy Coster and Stephanie Moore, present as well. Uh, so Smith. with that, sorry, what's up? I just said Stephanie Smith. I'm sure you got a lot of names. Sorry, sir. Got a lot of names to keep track of, but I just wanted for the record. <laughs> sorry, Stephanie. <laughs> um, yeah, so with that, I guess first order of business um, would be to uh, discuss and approve last Monday's meeting minutes. Um, Stephanie, Billy, have we had a chance to look that over and have any uh, amendments or um, clarifications? Oh, uh, Stephanie, you're muted. I do not have any clarifications. Uh, Billy? I think I'm good as well, thank you. Okay. Um, so with that, would someone like to motion to approve? So moved. I'll second. Okay, all in favor of approving uh, September 27th meeting minutes, say aye. Aye. Okay. Okay. Uh, meeting uh, minutes are approved. Um, let me actually just see something real quick. Okay, it doesn't look like Megan is actually on the line, so hopefully someone's taking um, meeting minutes. Um, but uh, if yeah, she, if so, she doesn't join Jacob, I'll work with Nelly and I will work together to, to can, use the recording and then we can go back. We can figure it out. Okay, that'd be great. I don't want to slow us down. Okay, no worries. So, yeah, so for today's meeting, um, I wanted us to kind of review, potentially vote or um, consensus approve some of the things that we had talked about in the previous meetings um, in regards to energy and waste. Um, so with that, I kind of sent over the energy recommendations. So I took what um, the PSD had uh, submitted as recommendations and kind of what we had talked about and kind of categorized it as like approve as written or things that we didn't necessarily have um, any concerns or issues or discussion too much about um, or outstanding questions. So I thought we can kind of go through that and um, see if any, you know, issues arise or if we feel comfortable um, I guess like formally kind of considering these are recommendations as well. Um, so kind of try to cut paste and summarize as best as possible the language from uh, what the PSD had, uh, had submitted. So um, it seems like the first part is for the CCP to adopt the um, Vermont commercial building energy standards. Um, they have it broken down into indoor opaque wall buildings, so standard indoor buildings um, with the envelope requirements, um, lighting for non-cultivation, um, non-cultivation areas uh, being with what the CVs is, and then um, moving for the energy efficiency requirement of 1.9 um, PPE, and then um, having HVAC uh, equipment. So I guess the big thing to point out here is that they have included like fans and motors that are not growth specific to be um, part of the new CVs and then um, as well as like all ventilation requirements be at the ASHRAE 62.1 level um, and then have added in there um, that for I guess, manufacturing or carbon dioxide enriched environments that they would follow the fire and building safety code um so how do you guys how's everyone feel about um those as written i guess i'm okay with using what was recommended by um the psd relative to the opaque building standards and the application of the cvs as am i all right perfect uh so then moving on to the kind of greenhouse energy standards so for this one they have recommended um, a u factor of 0 0.7 um, and 
air encouraging air barriers. Um, since that's an encouragement, I think we needed to discuss that um, all that much further. Uh, but yeah, the main thing is having um, a, a U factor of 0 0.7 on all greenhouse panels, uh, lighting at 1.7, and then having the uh, air conditioning equipment um, be at the CV standard, which will include fans, motors, um, et cetera. And then also including uh, low lighting, low greenhouses um, that would be exempt from these requirements at 40 kW connection. Um, I looked that up. That's also what California is doing and talking to some greenhouse cultivators. That seems to be you know, a reasonable um, limit. So how does everyone feel about the uh, greenhouse energy standard requirements? Um, I'm okay. These were as recommended by the PSD, just to clarify. Okay. Yes. And then, but the encouragement, um, I guess it's just encouraged. Because there's, there's an encouraged in the first bullet, and then there's a should in the third bullet. <laughs> so they're not like, they're not, a, and there are shalls mixed in there too. And I'm okay with that. I just wanted to point that it's not all who shall do this. That there's a fair bit of, uh, there's a little flexibility, I guess, in there. Um, but no clarification under what instances should or whatever, but I'm fine yeah. with that. <laughs> yeah, um, I want to, so yeah, what I was talking to Kyle earlier is like if we get consensus here, we'll do kind of a formal vote, I think, towards the end. Um, yeah, there might be a little inconsistencies here because they kind of laid out their standards and then also had the text language, so I kind of combined it. Um, but it does look like, uh, yeah, so all equipment used in the condition. Um, to condition the air shall meet the energy efficiencies described in the CV. So I'm imagining what they're referencing there is for non-cultivation, because uh, it, it says right here, like the fans and motors that are not equipment specific. Yep. And then um, serving cultivation shall be exempt from the CV's requirements for economizers as well as heat recovery. Um, and I know from an indoor cultivation perspective, um, economizers are kind of frowned upon because it introduces outside air, which can potentially have contaminants. Um, and then the heat recovery, I think, was, uh, I guess they also deemed it not necessary for, for greenhouses. Um, yeah. And then, um, let's see, what else was it, the shower? Or... Yeah, there's a should in the next sentence. All spaces within the facility should be current ventilation requirements for warehouses, which I guess is a, already a part of the CVs. And that, that might just be what the CV says. You know? Yeah. Which is fine. I'm just noting. And I think in the end, ultimately, they may be administering this. So these shoulds and shalls, <laughs> you know, they know what they're doing. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm going to highlight that, though, and make a note. Okay. Good. Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. And that's something that, in the process of our actual rulemaking, we'll we'll make sure we're lockstep with what PSD is, is trying to explain in their recommendations. Um, so yes, yeah, so Stephanie, I guess really with uh, get your opinion again on this low lighting, uh, low greenhouse exemption um, for 40 kW. Um, you know, they don't have a size requirement. Um, attached to that, so it would be any size greenhouse that just has 40 kW in regards to lighting. Um, you know, that could be quite a large greenhouse, I would imagine, because you could use, you know, up to 35, 36,000 watt lights. Um, but wanted to, yeah, just get your. Um, yeah, I actually, I don't, I don't think I have an informed opinion um, about that specifically. Okay. Um, if we need to check back in with um, Barry. We should do that, but I don't have an informed opinion. Okay. Yeah. No, 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 that's fine. I mean, on this one, I felt pretty comfortable with it. There was the okay. other one that had the um, like air conditioned space requirements, so I moved that down to more information section. Um, okay. uh, so, yeah, so the next part is uh, they have language for applying these regulations um, and uh, pretty much just go through for controlled environmental horticultural spaces, they have the indoor cultivation the greenhouse building and below indoor growing and change of occupancy. Yep. Um, I did, I guess, uh, strike the growing. So I felt like cultivation was a better term to be using this terminology. I wanted to kind of get your guys' opinion on it. I know it's like nitpicking, but it seemed like cultivation would be a better uh, 
down and growing. I think it's consistent with, is it, is, is it not consistent with the Act 164? I think they use cultivators as the term. So I think cultivation is fine. That, that's fine. Billy, do you have a yeah, I'm, I'm fine with that. I just see there's growing, there's a reference to growing below that, and I don't know if that's a different context, but um. Oh, I just brought out the first one just to remind me to bring that. Oh, up. okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, I agree. Keeping the language consistent with the act is probably the best best course of action. So then benchmarking requirements. So I kind of split this out between kind of some of the recommendations, but in general, um, this is the language that they use. Um, I just took out kind of the PSD recommends the CPD um, or CCP, uh, but that they um, to include specific requirements around benchmarking performance of cannabis uh, facilities, um, and then kind of goes into a little bit more specifics, but how cultivation facilities provide. Um, annual data for energy consumption by fuel. I added energy source. Um, to me, that makes a little bit more sense or is more comprehensive, uh, comprehensible to actual cultivators um, on a monthly uh, basis, as well as including consumption, so KWH and demand, um, onsite energy generation, water consumption, um, cannabis yield by weight. I mean, essentially, it's yeah, standard benchmarking that I think will be important for the CCB to have that information as well as just cultivators to be able to start, um, you know, on their kind of sustainability energy production journey. Um, how do you guys feel about? I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm fine with, you know, establishing benchmarking requirements. I'm, you know, I want to be sure that if we're requiring people to provide that information, that that information is actually used in some way, shape or form, just the provision of the information for the purposes of providing it without any next steps, it, it's pointless. <laughs> so I want to make sure that the CCB is like, oh yes, we want this information because we are going to use this for this purpose. And whether or not that needs to be incorporated in here or whoever it is, I mean, I went through this quickly, so I may have missed it. Um, but I just want to be sure that we're not collecting information to say we collected it, but we're collecting this information because we're going to do something. <laughs> Um, so would you be in favor of having that recommendation, adding a recommendation that this information be used for something? Yeah, like, yeah, if we're going to collect it, I think there needs to be some clarity of it about how it's going to be used by the CCB. And, it, you know, and it could be used in five years from now when like, we're going to, and I don't know, I mean, Kyle, I actually, I would look to you, like, what, what do you envision the CCB? using this information for if we're going to require that people keep it, maintain it, and submit it? Yeah, it's a good question, one that one that I'm, I'm not 100% sure I have an answer for um, at this point, but, but point well taken. Um, I don't want to collect data and, not, and re make requirements for stuff that, that, the, you know, that the CCB won't end up using, whether it's my time on the board or, or thereafter, you know what I mean? Yeah. So, or who has the expertise to use it? Like, are we gonna, is the CCB gonna engage somebody who has the expertise to do an analysis of this? Or are you going, you know, like, or can uh, the PSD have the expertise? Do they have the expertise to was, do the analysis on this? I was gonna mention that and, and maybe, you know, if this is if this is something that, that you arrive at a consensus on, any ideas that the three of you might have on how we can use this data to better, you know, bring along the, the, the health of our entire program and continuing to hit climate change goals, energy reduction goals, so on and so forth. So um, I think, yeah, I mean, go ahead. Yeah, I've got a lot of uh, ideas on this. I mean, one, I think efficiency of Vermont would be really useful. And I think as establishing a Vermont specific industry standard practice to help um, facilitate um, incentives um, and essentially work I think, with the Vermont Link PUC, a public public utility commission, to you know better fine tune incentives. I think the more information they have on you know can we choose this light or this HVAC equipment as opposed to this, these are the actual cost savings. Will help fine tune you know the rebates and incentive programs that are out there. Um, I think it'll help guide PSD and like 
by building codes are actually useful. Um, and then ideally, if Vermont is so inclined to CCB, it could set the basis for either future application requirements or you know some kind of incentivized program. Um, you know, if there's any um, requirements, you know, for renewable energy or carbon offsetting or whatnot, this will actually, you know, you'll have the information for each grow what their, you know, greenhouse gas emissions are, et cetera. Yeah. So I think there's definitely, you know, usefulness in that if, you know, the government agency wants to take that on, you know, or subcontract that out. Um, yeah, that was going to be my observation is that I think if we're starting from the beginning, starting from a place where this information is, is cataloged, is, is going to be much easier for folks than having to start tracking it in the future. So I think there's a value just in that extent. And then I would imagine this is stuff the, the board can report on and then hopefully use in the ways that Jacob had articulated. So I think unless there is like real pushback from licensees on doing this cataloging, it, it seems like a prudent first step that can always be revisited in the future. Yeah, no, I agree with I would agree with everything Jacob and, and Billy said. My mind immediately went to incentives, grant programs, so on and so forth. I mean, Stephanie, this maybe in a couple of years could be part of the Working Lands program. It might help from that perspective if it ever goes federal. It could help for federal grant applications, you know, so on and so forth. I think the board is has heard from other regulators in other states. It's very, it's vital to the, the long term success of a program to keep get as much data on day one, quote unquote day one, as possible. So at the beginning of the program to, to help decision making as the program kind of moves along in its maturity. Sure. No, I mean, I think I think it's great information. Like, I don't doubt that. Um, I just was, I just wanted to be cognizant of collecting and not necessarily doing anything. And I totally understand that people, it's better to require it upfront, um, point taken. <laughs> <laughs> try to build it later. Well, no, I, I appreciate your your thought and sentiment that you know I don't want to I don't want to ask for anything that we're not going to do anything with, right? I totally I don't want to put any more burdens on any size uh, cultivator, indoor or outdoor here. But I think there's some some things that we just don't necessarily know yet as a board. But this data will help inform a lot of what we hope to do and partnerships that we have with Efficiency Vermont help them zone in a little bit more on on how they can best help the industry as well. I think that it's just kind of a, an open open answer that it's important more so than those those specific instances where we've, we've game planned how to specifically use that data right right now. Yeah. So on that, um, on this topic, if you guys want to scroll down to the bottom of page two, then item two, further in further discussion, item two. So I pulled out from their recommendations because they had within there um, like facilities should be required to use either Cannabis Power Score or Energy Star Portfolio Manager to provide this data. Um, and I wanted to get um, your guys' opinion on do we want to require a specific reporting type or encourage one? Um, I'm, I feel like it's a bit overly prescriptive to require one or two. It's what Massachusetts does, um, but no other state, well, not many states are actually requiring um, the collection of this data. I know I think Boulder is in their own form or they're using Energy Star Portfolio Manager, but it kind of goes to your point, Stephanie, on making sure this information is used, but wanted to see kind of where your guys' perspective on is in requiring a specific platform um, to report the data or keep it as encouraging specific times and uh, specific types or allowing cultivators or manufacturers to, you know, or the CCB to create their own. You know, my recollection of the conversation with the Public Service Department was they didn't recommend the power score. Was that an act? Is that accurate? This was I, in the, the recommendations they provided. They did. Okay. I thought I thought they had. Yeah. No, that's fine. Um, no, I don't have an. You know, I, whatever's easiest in collecting information. Um, you know, like the recommendation could be this or some other format or you know, open ended. Um, but yeah, I don't have an opinion as to being scripted. <laughs> yeah, I think this goes a little to your question of studying what this is going to be used for, right? I know that um, across the state of Vermont Enterprise, we do state energy implementation plans that's directed by statute to help the state kind of reduce its energy consumption over time. And um, 
BGS is really pushing people to use the Energy Star Portfolio Manager to collect that data. We don't have to. You can provide data in other forms, but that's kind of the platform that they're using across, I think, the BGS enterprise. So there may be some value in using one thing just if there's a goal of kind of compiling, um, analyzing, and reporting data than having it come from different sources. But again, like that's that just begs the question of like how how are you going to use it? So I don't have a strong opinion one way or the other. I think flexibility is generally good, but if the board intends to kind of use this to data in a, an explicit way and do some management of it, they may want to have it come in through a uniform platform. That's I think that would be the consideration. So, so my thoughts on this is well, I see some parallels to the conversation about seed to sale tracking that the advisory committee had yes had yesterday. If it's an open API that allows any grower to use any system they want, how time intensive, labor intensive is it going to be on, on our end to make sure things are operating smoothly. You know, that being said, I would imagine unless we pull in some more energy specific folks in house, we will be partnering with PSD um, to kind of understand and digest a lot of the information and data that we would get back. And if this is what they're comfortable suggesting, I would imagine they've got some experience with both platforms and, and maybe that means that they don't anticipate as much logistical hurdles as, as might first you know be present. I don't know. Just just for what it's worth. Yeah, so it seems like consensus is kind of uh, we'll leave it up to the regulatory agency. Uh, who wants to <laughs> pick one that, that we're not really strong either way on requiring one or providing recommendations on that. I would agree. Yeah, okay. um, yeah, perfect. So yeah, so moving along, um, they had recommended the adoption of the greenhouse definition that was contained in the um, international kind of building codes, um, which is a structure or a thermally isolated building, or sorry, area of a building that maintains a specialized sunlit environment exclusively used for and essentially to the cultivation, protection, or maintenance of plants. Greenhouses are those that are erected for a period of 180 days or more. How do um, people feel about this, I guess, specifically Stephanie, um, since you've got the, the ag expertise. Yeah, I was actually concerned that that definition of greenhouse would make it apply broader, and maybe not, maybe this isn't true, then, um, or interpret it to apply more broadly beyond just cannabis cultivation, because um, greenhouses are used in other cultivation, <laughs> um, and this greenhouse standard will only apply to cannabis Greenhouses. So I was wondering whether or not we should be more specific and say cannabis instead of plants. Um, and then the other thing I had um, was whether or not uh, we wanted to say used for 180 days rather than you know erected for 180 days. In the, is it in the calendar year? I'm not even sure. Um, maybe it doesn't say that. Uh, but anyway, so those were my kind of two suggestions was changing plants to cannabis and changing, not necessarily just erected, but actually being used for that time period. But maybe not, maybe that's not appropriate. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, um, I agree with the cannabis part. I mean, I think they're giving like a very broad definition for like all yeah. greenhouses where they pulled it from. Um, so for this specific, I could see, yeah, adding cannabis plants. Um, it seems like I would imagine because it's building codes, that's why they chose the term erected, um, because this is what like I think would fall under the 1.7 PPE requirement for lights, and and then the um, U factor of 0.7, you um, know, it's more on the building structure, not in the use necessarily. Yep. Um, okay. But um, if you like, yeah, I'm all for about less. Regulatory, regulatory things on small farmers or farms that need just have something already erected, that it would be more um, beneficial, I guess, or, or more uh, relevant if it was for used, you know, for 180 days. days. Yeah, then they might, you know, depending on the, the nature of, of like a hoop house or, or whatever right now, they might then have to physically take take it down and put it up each, each growing season, right? Um, yeah, I'm thinking like, we see a lot of people, uh, a lot of farmers are using like, you know, low tech greenhouses for like propagation, you know, start their seeds um, or for their clones 
um, you know, prior to transplanting to the ground. So it's a really small um, or short time frame. And I know some of those need to comply with the stringent kind of energy requirements if it's used for, you know, a month or so or two. Yeah. That, I mean, that's kind of what I was thinking. Like, you, it might stay up, but you might not use it for that full 180 days and we're asking for it to be built to a standard. But in the, in the opposite side, you've built a structure that needs a code regardless of how often you use it. You may scale up to use it more frequently and then you're stuck in a place where you're not compliant. <laughs> so I, you know, I argue both sides. to even high THC cannabis production or something like that, because you're gonna get a lot of questions about how this relates to hemp then, Stephanie, and I mean, the agency's gonna answer a lot of questions because I've been on the receiving end of them. Uh, when, when these kind of things happen, just because people are gonna be reading it and wondering how it applies to other stuff that they may be doing on farm. So um, I, I think my position as a board member would be supportive of, of changing that plant to cannabis, even, even get, refining it more so than than that, and I think this word erected could be taken a bunch of different ways um, and interpreted a bunch of different ways by the folks on here in the room, but also anybody looking at this as a license holder that would be, you know, looking to set up this model of, um, you know, an outdoor cultivation operation. So, but but understand we can go a bunch of different ways. I'm not tied to any specific one. I think just whatever gives the most, um, will want flexibility to small cultivators, but also the most, you know, I, I don't want the definition to become so overly, you know, um, complicated that it's gonna invite more questions um, than, than it's intending to. Yeah, so I'll move this to needing a little bit more discussion and we can pick it up in a kind of future, because the other thing I'm thinking about also is like, solid foundation is, is a lot of the times how we would classify um, greenhouses like permanent structures as opposed to and i feel like for erected like if you're erecting a greenhouse for the grow season then really how you know um solid is that greenhouse going to be you know to, to be even required um or uh you know i think it would be exempt in a lot of this so i think just getting some more information about that um, and talking to growers um, who are currently cultivating might be good to get their opinion on this. Okay. Um, so then, uh, moving on to the low energy building exemption. Um, so it would be uh, the following low, uh, low energy buildings or portion thereof. Um, so this is in the greenhouse section. I shall be exempt from the building thermal envelope provisions, um, which is the factor of 0 0.7. So I crossed out the first one, which is that peak design rate. Um, my understanding, I'm still getting some more information on it, is like 3.1, 3.4 BTU, so like one watt per square foot for space conditioning is just not enough to actually be useful. Like no one will fall on that exemption, even if you had, you know, season extending hoop houses and you needed to use, you know, low tech kind of propane heaters, you're most likely potentially going to go over that threshold. Um, I just got last night um, some of the meeting notes for California regs because they discussed this as well. And um, so I'm gonna go through those, but I know they were settling more on 10 BTUs an hour per square foot, um, and then five in some instances. So I wanted to get some more information. So that's why that one's crossed out. Um, and then the other two requirements are those that are not conditioning space, and then those that have an average U factor of less than 0 0.7, which I guess it's supposed to be in there, but it kind of, if the exemption is to not have to have 0.7 U-factor, uh, um, not quite sure why, um, you know, you would automatically qualify for that. But how do people, um, yeah, feel about the low building um, as these, uh, these two kind of exemptions stand? Um, I'm curious to what 
extent will people build to meet the exemption? So, right. So I, and I and I, I think I just don't. I don't know the you know the. Sometimes people just build to not have to comply with something. I mean that's just rampant in any regulation. <laughs> Um, yeah, I mean, so I guess my question is, is how this is written, so this is like for the exemption of having to comply with the building thermal envelope provision, which is having a U factor of 0 0.7. So first one is they don't have any um, condition space. So that's fine. That's like a very passively cooled you know, greenhouse. And then the other one is saying, you know, assemblies and greenhouses that have an average U factor less than or equal to 0 0.7. Um, that's already in compliance with what they're um, mm -hmm. requiring. So it just seems like the biggest one was, um, you know, a lower, uh, what's it called? Uh, yeah, just having a lower footprint. But in the, give me one second. Um, okay, so yeah, I have down in like the more information part. Um, that there is, um, the, I guess, reasoning behind this is that uh, the greenhouse is exempt from building envelope requirements. Uh, this would be allowed for seasonal growing with some heat used to extend the growing period into the shoulder months. So that's kind of the intention for allowing these exemptions. Um, so they don't want permanent greenhouse structures or full season um, greenhouses to not, you know, to have to be energy efficient, and then if you're just using it to extend the season, you should be exempt. And so that's why I wanted to put 3.4 BTUs on pause, because I don't think if you're going to be extending the season, that's enough to actually be applicable. So I'd like the limit to be somewhere where, you know, if you are just extending the season, you'd be able to, you know, um, get the exemption. Yes, that makes sense to me. I think that makes sense, but there might you might want to pair it with some sort of temporal constraint also. So like for no more than however many months or you know days, so that it, it truly is for extending at those edges and not intended to push through for the whole winter. If that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean we can um, limit potentially the number of harvests. Um, with most kind of climate control greenhouses, you're looking at, you know, four, six, eight, give or take. Um, but when you're season extending, you know, you're going to have your full season and then maybe one at the beginning and one at the end. So you'd be like three harvests um, or less. Okay. So yeah, I'll make that note um, right now. Sounds good. And then, um, so then they have for other kind of equipment efficiencies, which are kind of buried in the recommendations, or just kind of one-liners. Um, so they've recommended that the CCB include requirements or update requirements for fans according to the 2021 IECC, um, and as well as adopt requirements for the clean water pumps, um, which is in the federal code. Um, I think they just got enacted as well. Um, I don't really have uh, too much knowledge about it. I mean, I looked at what it required. It was super technical. Um, so I would defer to PSD on what the requirements are, but I wanted to get um, your opinion on that. I would defer to them as well. I don't, I don't think I have the knowledge base to, you know, be inform make an informed opinion. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I would rely on their expertise here as well. Okay. And then, um, yeah, so further discussion. So I did want to bring up um, that, you know, that we're requiring these high efficiency lights, which is going to uh, require growers to you know, install more expensive um, lights, the double-ended high pressure sodiums, the ceramic metal halides, and the um, LEDs. You know, from a cultivation, cultivator perspective, I wanted to kind of just bring up that 
industry standard a lot of times for propagation. So when you have clones um, that, you know, the lighting load is much lower than what you would need for the vegetative or flowering stage. And most people are using kind of T5 fluorescents, which are you know, much more um, economically you know, uh, reasonable. Um, this would be preventing that. So I wanted to see if there was interest or, um, or you just bring up that should we create a carve out to allow for kind of standard practice on this part of cultivation, which is really a small footprint, um, or not necessarily worry about it. I know I brought it up with Jill and she was saying that they should have um, incentives to be able to help offset the cost to the cultivators. Um, it just seemed that I'm not sure having LED lights during you know, propagation is necessarily the most advantageous uh, energy efficiency measure. During how long of the year? I mean, I agree, like setting a high bar for all use in indoor cultivation, um, including the propagation phase, um, seems like a lot. Um, but it, uh, in an expense to somebody who's, you know, starting up and, you know, but anyway, but um, so, so it makes sense to maybe not require it in small portions, but maybe we could put a square footage limit on that. Um, would that make sense to, so that there's at least a, a objective criteria for how big your propagation rooms are? <laughs> Um, no, that makes sense. Um, and I think potentially doing it as a percentage of total cultivation space, um, not to exceed. Um, but then you had just made a comment, um, like how long do they run it for? And well, I was thinking about it, it's like if it's an indoor cultivator, they're and they're like doing kind of a perpetual harvest, so they're pulling down rooms every week or every month. They're going to be running actually these lights year round. Okay. Um, so then it would kind of make sense. Okay. <laughs> Didn't think about that before, yeah. <laughs> are there going to be, yeah, are there, is there a space in this framework for people who are just going to be producing clones, like, as their sole product, and this is all they're going to be doing, just propagating? I believe, I think it's possible. Um, I mean, there's certainly a license, I think there's a license type that includes that. Um, yeah, that's the right. industry license. Yeah, we're looking at that. I mean, Stephanie's on the market structure committee. You can you can say that here, Stephanie. I don't. I think I think that's the direction that that um, that subcommittee is is going in, where there would be a nursery or a seed starter specific license type that you could also. My the, yeah, go ahead. My inclination would be to keep a high standard broadly, and then if you want to kind of create a specific carve out for really small scale propagators who are you know have one light that they're running, you know not much a year to prop or you know a small propagation stuff then then that sounds reasonable but that probably just the baseline should be a high standard and then kind of create a carve out for something smaller from there if that seems necessary i, I agree with that okay. um so moving on so then we'll be on uh further discussion number three so we already talked about number two and this was just so they had recommended um a part of the application process um so applying for the license that they um uh, have cold rx licensees um submit written operating procedures over the following um like how they will ensure that equipment is so essentially facilities maintenance plans which i think is important for efficient operation of uh of Patients and, and manufacturers, um, and then that they regularly assess their um, opportunities to reduce energy and water uses, et cetera, which would be, you know, I think kind of going to what you were talking about, Stephanie, is like making sure the growers are using the information that the state, the CCCB is requiring. My question on this is they have it for every four years, or sorry, every five years. That seemed like a long time to me, especially with everything, you know, technology continually changing in the cannabis industry and also just, I don't think that's going to encourage cultivators to use the data that's being collected um, or submitted. So I wanted to gauge um, your guys' perspective opinions on remove, like changing that limit to two or three years. I, I mean, I totally get that, you know, technology 
technology in the industry is probably moving faster than five years, so that seems, the five-year time frame seems um, long. Um, but I'm also wondering the life cycle of some of the equipment. Uh, you know, like how does that play into looking at what you're doing? I mean, you're not gonna if you've spent money on equipment and it still has a useful life, are you going to replace it? Have a public comment? That period? And, you know, obviously this could be rolling. It's not not requiring yeah. people. One take action time to reserve. Or maybe Thank it is. <laughs> but I just wanted to think about that as well. Um, that we should look at life cycle of equipment because just getting rid of equipment for the sake of getting rid of it to upgrade just creates waste. So I, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Uh, d definitely encouraging like a, a replacement broken um, mindset. I, I was thinking, you know, because they do have strategies in here, which is like lighting schedules, active load management, you know, energy storage, potentially. Um, renewable energy. I wasn't necessarily thinking about of changing equipment, but more um, ensuring that they are kind of doing like a strategic energy management, you know, an assessment of the cultivation when it comes to, I think, more of the operation of the equipment they have and, and ways to improve it. So a lot of times, you know, what we see is um, either implementing or upgrading climate control, um, like controllers, um, looking at the set points they're using in regards to like temperature and humidity, um, looking at like the timing um, of things, um, how essentially their like irrigation schedule is, um, you know, affecting their dehumidification equipment, things like that. Um, well, with that information, if you're just dialing in your system, then I think two to three years is probably more appropriate than five. Billy, do you have a perspective? Uh, I, I totally hear what you're both saying and, and tend to agree with you. I just, the way this is currently written, it doesn't seem to kind of compel licensees to do anything other than to kind of maintain a, a plan. So updating the plan doesn't necessarily mean they're going to kind of make these changes necessarily. You know, they might have to assess opportunities, but it doesn't mean they have to kind of pursue any of them. So. I wonder what the value of this is, but I, I think it makes sense to have it on a shorter duration if you all do. It may, this may be something where you just want to be careful in the rulemaking. You don't like set a, a period that can only be revised through additional rulemaking, that you give the board the discretion to kind of adjust the, the pendency of this requirement you know, over time. So you know, start with something shorter and that they realize they don't really need, once the industry gets more settled, they don't need this as frequently, they can put the, the data out further. That would be my suggestion. Kyle, I have a question for you. Does the CCB from us looking for specific language on this or recommendations? Like would A, we recommend a shorter time frame than the PSD report? We think, you know, three years or something like that. Or do you want us to kind of give you, you know, sample, uh, regulation language that you can kind of work off of? I would say, at least as it relates to certain parts of what um, we've got to write from an energy and environmental perspective, you know, our general counsel and executive directors certainly don't come from that world, and I know that our general counsel would certainly be very appreciative of any draft regulatory language you might be able to help provide, Jacob. Okay. Especially when it relates to this very technical energy um, energy language that's a language in and of itself. Gotcha. Okay. I'm interpreting that as you would prefer that, but if we don't necessarily settle on a time, <laughs> a justification would be useful as well. Yeah, no, or at least, you know, open to having conversations to help us help ensure that we're we're reflecting the spirit of the recommendations in, in our rulemaking. Yeah. Or, or the language can be like an initial plan, you know, updated, you know, every two to two or three years, whatever you settle on, um, you know, uh, you know, kind of the the occurrence of which can be adjusted in the future by the board or something like that. I'm confident David could give us that flexibility in a in a rulemaking, you know, in, in draft rulemaking, but just making sure we have the technical aspect of what we're intending to gotcha. achieve, Jacob. That's where you could be very helpful, and Billy, and okay. Stephanie. Yeah. Gotcha. And also having here, um, kind of also that we recommend the CBC create like technical guidance on compliance with these regulations, because this does seem, you know, I think from an, a, an average grower entering the industry or coming from the legacy market into the legal market, this would not make
make sense. Absolutely. Um, and so just ensuring compliance, so I think there's a lot of leeway and potentially crafting this to say that, um, you know, uh, look for like the main terminology of this, but that, you know, there is, um, when applying for licenses, they have written operation procedures for whatever, and then leaving the guidance um, as a separate thing. It says like this should be maintained every two to three years, but gives you the flexibility without having to go back to change any regulations. Yeah, I was actually curious about the, um, are we presuming that the people who are gonna obtain licenses understand any of this? And do they have the expertise to, to do it? Um, so and whether or not the state needs to provide technical assistance uh, or engage with somebody that can provide this, or maybe it's efficiency Vermont, um, should be told, but. I was, I was gonna say, I, I would imagine we would give guidance on how to interpret this. We've gotta make sure we don't cross the line into giving business or, or technical advice, you know what I mean? So I'm sure we will have, we'll, we'll put out guidance, but also make sure we're in touch with efficiency Vermont and other folks in this space to make sure they understand the regulations and can help um, you know spread that, that message accordingly. Um, and then I really, since we're running out of time, the last one I wanted to bring up, so we didn't talk too much about it. I know, um, Billy, in the meeting minutes, you had recommended this is for the on-site renewable energy that you were um, opposed to requiring um, these kind of um, regulations and for encourage. So I just wanted to bring that back up um, yeah, to the group. My only point was that requiring these enterprises to net meter just may not be feasible economically or kind of otherwise. Um, it may run afoul of other kind of energy goals the state has on where where to invest in kind of renewable energy generation. So um, I, I'm certainly very supportive of, you know, pairing generation with load and, you know, having these sorts of facilities um, generate their own power, if that makes sense, within the kind of context of existing net meter programs. I, I'm just a little wary of creating any, um, there, there's an active debate in the state around whether it's in the state's best interest to have our power come from larger utility developed generators that are distributed around the grid that achieve a certain economy of scale versus incentivizing private individuals to generate their own power at their homes and businesses. And there's pros and cons to both, uh, but there's a significant cost delta in, in for each kilowatt of, the, of that electricity. And I just don't wanna do something <laughs> that's gonna throw this industry in the middle of that um, debate by, so that, that's what I'm, I'm, I'm frankly cautious about. Um, and I'm just trying to read what the recommendation is here. So it's, yeah, essentially it's saying that um, for new buildings, it would be solar ready. Yeah, I think that's that seems fine to me from my perspective. So my other question, um, Billy, was what is Vermont's stance on other renewables? Because it seems like they were only targeting solar. I don't know if there's a big push in Vermont for solar, but what about wind or micro hydro or geothermal as being acceptable alternatives? Yeah, there's certainly um, a significant existing portfolios of both wind and hydro. Most of them are at larger scales. There is some micro hydro. There are small kind of net metered wind products um, in operation in Vermont. I think those just typically have more locational constraints than solar does, um, especially in like a commercial setting. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's reasonable for people to um, explore those options as well. I just think this is probably looking in the context of like new commercial buildings in settings where solar is probably the most practicable generation type. Um, you might be able to put up a small wind turbine. You need to be near water to do micro hydro, so you know that's a much more limiting factor. Um, yeah, I was just thinking from a yeah, this definitely is kind of tailored to more I think like an urban um, environment. Right. Thinking, you know, with the ruralness of Vermont, and you know, if someone's putting in you know an indoor cultivation facility or even like a bigger processing facility in more of a rural environment, then wind might make sense um, if they have the land and are not necessarily. Not encroaching on neighbors. 
Yeah, and you might, you know, you potentially could, I don't know. I think this is something where you, if, if this was an important consideration, you could build in some discretion that, you know, or another technology as approved by the, the board or something like that. But I, I think this is like a proactive, we want to make sure that new buildings um, have the potential for solar generation. Um, and you do that when you're kind of constructing and engineering the building to make sure the roof it, it has the right aspect and can carry the loads, et cetera. Um, <coughs> typically, you're not thinking about the siting of wind or hydro when you're constructing a standalone building. Th those have their own kind of support structures or, or engineering that's separate from the building itself. So I think this shouldn't preclude people from exploring that. And if, if that's what they intend to do at their site, then maybe there's a, an out that lets them um, avoid having to build, you know, a solar radius structure if they're going to propose another renewable generation at their site. But um, this seems like a good baseline uh, expectation. Okay. And also the exemptions are pretty much from remember with the conversation with Barry as well. Um, we're geared towards, you know, if it's not feasible, then they don't have to comply. Right. Yeah, okay. I think, the, you know, these stands are really just to make sure we're not losing opportunities, right? If someone's going to invest in a new structure that um, can serve um, as a good base for for renewable generation through solar like we should make sure that it's built to support that um, since the the marginal cost is usually pretty minimal if you're doing from scratch so any, any last uh, comments on this subcommittee are interested in kind of an exemption for other on-site renewable generation you could probably build that into the exemptions but I it seems like a, a different analysis than what's currently happening in this clause um, I just yeah my main thing about the other ones was just making sure that you know we weren't pigeonholing people to just having to do solar if there were other things they wanted to do even like toe gen kind of things like that um, sure. right, and so, yeah, the only thing we didn't really cover, uh, so I have to open up to public commenting, is really that we have other we have things comment? on the equipment no. efficiency requirement, which is Did you have a public comment? Um, <laughs> number five. Um, Billy, we don't, uh, excuse me, uh, Jacob, we don't have any public comments in the room unless anybody's changed their mind, so I think we can go right to the top of the hour. Okay, sounds good. Yeah, so then really the last ones um, are actually, before we get into those, I think those are kind of easy. They had a line in there that said like requiring air, fil air filtration for buildings that are drying plant material. Um, I wanted to push that to when we do air quality and odor in the future meetings, but um, initially it didn't make all that much sense to me um, that they would limit it one to drying plant material and not like the flowering stage of cultivation if it was really a concern about noxious odors. Uh, but then also that's just a very uh, I don't know, I think slippery slope, but didn't want to just throw that on your guys' radar. That that'll be something we'll talk to you about in the air quality and voters thing. Yeah, I remember bringing this up to Barry, and Barry's like, yeah, you can take that out. So <laughs> I think we can just take that out of this conversation. Perfect. Um, yeah, and then the um, last bit is, yeah, just going into their recommendations for equipment efficiency requirements. Um, they have it for heating and cooling to be in compliance with the new 2021 IECC, um, and then as well as allowing for these economizer requirement exemptions for installing high efficiency cooling, and then into like standalone humidifications, all that. So that's really technical. You guys agree we will defer to PSD's um, recommendations on these? Yes. Yep. Yeah, and I saw last night that these are the same ones that were just adopted by California. So it does seem like there's consensus within the industry or within the regulatory energy agencies that this is uh, okay. Uh, so I guess with that, we could probably um, well, I have a few minutes. Um, I have a couple more minutes. Yeah. So then with the organic waste, um, it seemed like the main thing was um, agreeing on a definition for the organic material from cannabis. Um, so I threw in, we are recommending that we 
exclude the rendering unusable and unrecognizable thing from the definition. It doesn't seem like that's even uh, part of the conversation. Um, but uh, within the meeting minutes, and it seems like from um, our last meeting, that essentially basing it off of leading your residuals um, would be good to say, like, cannabis or cannabis material um, means source separated, compostable, and treated vegetative matter. I don't know if we need to include all that other stuff. Um, but uh, yeah, I kind of wanted to mainly get your opinion on this, Stephanie, on figuring it out. I did do some research for other states, and it seems like a lot of them, when it's classified as commercial, have just said cannabis, like waste is commercial organic material. Um, but yeah. So, yeah. so okay. I was going to say, since our conversation, I've gotten some kind of additional input from the solid waste division, and I think they have a kind of a, a threshold question that is unclear to them, and that's whether cannabis is a regulated material in Vermont, because if so, then that will kind of inform solid waste management options um, and to, you know, kind of inform whether there is rules related to kind of custody and safety during disposal that needs to be applied, and that, that may affect this conversation. So I don't know the answer to that question, but that that's kind of late into me today. And when you say regulated material, you mean something regulated by the public safety division as a I or believe drug. So. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I don't know the answer to that. I think we need that information. I mean, I was hoping that I was thinking maybe could we make a recommendation that it should not be a regulated material maybe? <laughs> um, so that it can easily go into um, compost piles and it doesn't have to be unrecognizable and rendered unusable, <laughs> which I think is quoting public safety stuff. <laughs> yeah. Kyle, any um, updates on that? I don't have an answer for you right now. I know we're at 12.59. Billy, why don't you and I and, and, and Jacob perhaps kind of connect offline? Kyle, I think you're muted. Sorry about that. I know it's one o'clock now, um, and we're opening up a can of worms in this conversation. Why don't Billy? Why don't you, Jacob, and I kind of connect offline on this specifically, and we can kind of get to the bottom of it. Stephanie, I know you're not able to join us next Wednesday, but Jacob, maybe I know we're talking about water next next Wednesday, but let's let's build out some time in the agenda to talk about waste because I know Kerry will be here, and I'm sure he he's knowledgeable in the waste space, at least on the agriculture side of things as well. So, um, but let's try and unpack this um, who has jurisdiction type of question um, as it relates to this um, okay. before next Wednesday and at least get a sense of, of where we should go. I got to jump off. I got to go to the next meeting. Okay. Yeah, I, I think that sounds reasonable. And, you know, if there's any value in, um, you know, Jacob, if you want to just talk directly with some of the solid waste folks, you know, I'm, I'm happy to make that connection. I'm happy to stay in, in the middle of it as well. But if there's just kind of some specific details that you feel like a technical conversation with them would help resolve, um, that's another opportunity. Like, I'm, I'm happy to share the document that was circulated with your recommendation with them and get some feedback on it. But uh, um, just wanted to put it out there that happy to connect you and with the, the folks if necessary in the program. Billy, if you, oh, could, yeah, if you could share that with me as well, I can make sure I can run it up the flagpole, so to speak, online to make sure that we're not doing work that is somebody's going to come and tell us that, you know, you're doing <laughs> not as intended, you know what I mean? So. Right. Yeah, I don't. Yeah, I don't think this is anything we're doing. It's more just to understand kind of what opportunities exist within the solid waste management um, frame. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So I'll, I'll I'll get back to them and indicate that this question is not answered, um, and ask them if they have thoughts or recommendations on that and the kind of document that you uh, circulated with the kind of summary of the waste conversation. Uh, let me clean up that document to um, pose more questions that they'd be able to answer. Yeah, and I'll, yeah. I'll get that to you um, by the end of this week. Awesome. All right, thank you guys. Thanks, we'll everybody. Great.